Hello, everybody. Um, this is Chaplain Bob. Just wanting to kind of apologize for not being putting out as much material lately as I'd like to. I've uh, been busy and I just haven't felt, uh, I guess you could say, inspired to, to put out some things. Um, it's been kind of depressing looking at the current state of affairs of the world. I just can't believe how evil the world has become since uh, I was a kid. I mean, kids are being kidnapped by the government, and they're, they call it Child Protective Services, and then they disappear from the system. Then you got the uh, Pizzagate thing, which I t totally believe is true. Who's involved, I don't know. It probably, probably most politicians and high-ranking government officials all over the world. Uh, just unbelievable. And you've got uh, the church is just about dead. You've got a remnant, but the uh, corporate churches are pretty much useless. I don't know. It's It's been pretty sick, really. Uh, Satanism is rampant. Sodomy is rampant. I mean, things when I was a kid that were just weren't even spoken in public are now being shouted from the uh, TV stations and radio and newspapers. So, I mean, I forget what it was. I was kind of, I don't know. I wouldn't say I was watching something, but I saw something. I don't, I don't remember if it was a cartoon or what, but they were making a joke out of uh, kidnapping and child rape on like, I don't know. I don't remember what it was. I was just so disgusted. I, I was just kind of flipping through the channels. And it's pretty amazing. But I want you to think about something. Now, I know full well, Jesus did not say, believe on me and the Sabbath and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say that. I usually try to do my studies on the day of rest. I mean, because that's the day that the Lord said, yep, you know, put aside uh, your, your day of work. It was the day to reflect on the Lord, the day to do Bible studies, the day to um, think about the things that he had done and to learn more of him. But I find it interesting that uh, if, if the calendar hasn't been changed and from Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown, ah, you didn't know that from sundown to sundown is a day, huh? The day starts at sundown. It doesn't start at midnight. Where did we get that? You know? But the... Uh, Muslims, do you know that they're, they changed their Sabbath to the day before, Saturday, the seventh day of the week? Did you know that? They changed it to the day of the before. And what did the Vatican do, the Catholic Church? Well, they changed it to the day after, on Sunday. So isn't that interesting You've got those that made it the day before, and you got those that the day after. And then the um, what Jesus called the synagogue of Satan in Revelation 2.9, they want you to think that, you know, they properly keep it and that they're the true chosen people. Now, I'm not telling anybody that they have to keep the Sabbath, because... Jesus didn't, you know, Paul didn't go to the Greeks and say, oh, believe on Jesus and keep the Sabbath and thou shalt be saved. But here's some interesting verses. Um, in Exodus 20 and verse 8, Jesus, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not Jesus. Well, actually, Jesus gave us the law prior to his incarnation and the virgin birth into a human form. 
Jesus is called the Word of God. He was the lawgiver. But that is a, another study. But in Exodus 20, verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Hmm. And in Exodus 16, verse 26, when Israel was in the wilderness, the Lord was providing manna. And they were, uh, Moses wrote, Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath in it, there shall be none. So, you know, the people that went out on the seventh day looking for the manna, well, there wasn't any. And they were told to gather double on the day before, the sixth day. You know, that's the thing. I, I always tell people, you know, you need to read the Old Testament. In Exodus 20 and verse 11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested, rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. In Exodus 31 and verse 13, he said, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So the Sabbath was to be a sign between the Lord and Israel or between his people. Now your modern demon nominational church will say, well, you know, that's for the Jews. We're Christians. That doesn't apply to us. Well, everything that you show them, they'll tell you, well, that applies, you know, something in the Old Testament. Well, well that, that's for the Jews. That's, that's not for us. Now, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 5, and he, who's speaking, Jesus, and he said unto them, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. You know, and it's interesting, in the 13th chapter of Luke, uh, Jesus used to perform healings. He used to heal the sick on the Sabbath day. And the Jews would accuse him, Oh, you're, you're working, you're breaking the Sabbath. But in verse, in Luke 13, 15, the Lord then answered to him and said, Thou hypocrite. Jesus used that word a lot when he was speaking to the Jews. Thou hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And it's true. You will water your animals, but you're going to call me a false messiah because I would heal the sick on the Sabbath day? That is what basically Jesus was telling the hypocrites, the, you know, the hypocritical Jews. And let's face it. You know, if they found it, he told them another time, if you had an animal in a pit, you're, you're going to get him out of that pit. On, if it happens on the Sabbath day, you're not going to wait until the next day. No, you're going to pull that animal out. And basically, the Jews were saying, well, you know, the animals are more important than the people that Jesus was healing. So, let's keep reading. In Exodus 31, 16. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. You know what perpetual means? It means forever. I find that interesting. In Leviticus the book of Leviticus. Now, the book of Leviticus was for the Levite priests. Moses and Aaron were of the tribe of Levi. 
And the book of Leviticus was a special book for training for the priests. Okay? It was specifically for them to train the rest of the 11 other tribes. But we read the following. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Now, the tribe of Levi had an everlasting covenant with the Lord that no other of the 11 tribes had. They were to be the priest tribe. They were to serve the Lord, the Levites. And then you have the children of Judah. They were to be the tribe of the kings. David and Solomon were of the tribe of Judah. They were the kings. Christ is from the tribe of Judah. Okay? Leviticus 25, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Let's skip to verse 4. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Now, you know, it's interesting. Agricultural scientists are just now starting to figure out that when you let the land sit for a year, it replenishes it. And you don't have to put huge tons, you know, tons and tons of fake artificial fertilizer upon it. So, you know, it's, the uh, Bible has a whole bunch of laws that work. People love to tell you, oh, the laws were all nailed to the cross. But, you know, there were government laws for criminals. For example, if they found somebody that was a murderer and you had two or three witnesses against them, you know, somebody goes into a liquor store, uh, robs it and kills the owner, and you've got three witnesses, you know, the guy runs out into the arms of a couple of policemen and a couple of uh, customers that were, you know, watched the whole thing. Well, the Bible says they were to be put to death before the sun went down the next day. You know, if they did this at noon... Before the sun went down, they were to die. They were supposed to put away evil. And uh, the Bible has agricultural laws. Not to plant um, diverse or multiple seeds in your field. I mean, what happens when you've got a row of tomatoes, a row of corn, a row of potatoes, and a row of I don't know, uh, pick something, cauliflower, and then another row of carrots. Well, what happens when the bees come? And they get on the carrot plant, and then they go to the potatoes, and then they go to the squash. You know, the thing is, you can't use the pollen from a corn, plant of corn, to pollinize and reproduce the um, carrots. You know, that's why it, it was, the Lord said, don't, don't plant multiple diverse things in your field. You know, a row of this and a row of that and a row of this and a row of that. It just, you know, it makes sense. And we didn't understand all this until we started studying genetics. And genetics is a fairly new field of study. There was a guy named Mendelssohn, a German I believe it was around the 1500s he started uh, observing genetics. But really, we didn't start understanding a lot of stuff until the 1950s when Crick and Watson uh, discovered um, DNA. And it wasn't until we had powerful electron microscopes that we actually understood all this stuff. And, uh, you know, the Bible laws... Um, they make sense. They really do. And they were given for our health. You know, uh, pork, pigs, 
Uh, you've heard of swine flu. Well, that's just one of over a hundred other different diseases that are known to be trans, uh, transferred from pigs to man. And there's like 200 other diseases that are um, suspected, but they haven't put the research into it to find out if it's true or not. So, you know, there's a, you know, and just because you cook pork doesn't necessarily mean you, you kill all these diseases. I mean, you could just walk by some pigs that have the uh, swine flu and breathe the air that they're putting out and catch it. Does cooking get rid of that? No. It absolutely doesn't. Um, you know, Jesus didn't say, believe on me and don't eat pork and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say that. Matter of fact, uh, you know, the Greeks were big pork eaters and Paul went to the Greece and preached. You know? But is it wise to eat disease-laden, filth, uh, filthy meats? I don't think so. I really don't. I think it's a good idea to avoid it. Is it a salvational issue? Absolutely not. Is the, salva uh, is the Sabbath a salvational issue? I don't believe it is. But it was to be a sign. It was supposed to be a, a covenant, you know, to be, um, to be set apart. It was a day of rest. The Lord didn't want us working seven days a week. I remember when I was working overtime to buy my house. I worked like 17, oh, I'm sorry, like uh, I used to work like 17 hour days, some days, and then I worked like 21 or 22 days in a row. There was like three weeks I had not one day off, and I was working double shifts, um, like 17 hour days. I was exhausted, you know? What can I tell you? Here's an interesting verse. Isaiah. I've been doing a lot of stuff in Isaiah lately. Chapter 58, verse 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And they're talking about, you know, the paths of righteousness. And uh, when you're talking about the breach, well, you know, the Lord put up a wall and the people, uh, you know, they broke down the wall. You always hear these, these, these fake preachers saying, break down that wall. Well, guess what? The Lord put that wall there. That's what a breach is. Verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. See, the Sabbath wasn't to be a, a miserable burden. It was supposed to be a delight. It was a day that you were to rest and enjoy the rest from the Lord, um, the rest for your body, and, and to take a spiritual rest and, and you know, Read the law, the read the Bible, and, you know, I don't know. But, but the, uh, the, the hypocrites turned it into a, a whole bunch of man-made rules and regulations. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Oh, whose words are we supposed to speak? The Lord's words. Verse 14. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Hmm. 
Now in the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 6, now the background of Lamentations is Jeremiah and what happened after the Lord had taken Jerusalem into captivity by the Babylonians. Perhaps you've heard of Nebuchadnezzar, the book of Daniel. Well, that's what that was. And prior to that, northern Israel had been taken captive by the Assyrians into their captivity. And they never returned to the land. But let's let's take a look at this. And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle. And who's he? The Lord. And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle, as if it were of a garden. He hath destroyed his places of the assembly. The Lord hath caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. He hath despised, in the indignation of his anger, the king and the priest. See, it was the Lord that caused the, the, the feast days and the Sabbaths to be forgotten. Well, actually, it, the people forgot them. You know, they were keeping them, sort of, kind of, but in a bad way. And the Lord was angry with the king, and he was angry with the priests, because... They serve themselves and the devil and not the Lord. So the Lord is like, oh, well, okay, well, then you can go and serve Babylon and you can serve Assyria. I've had it with you people, away with you. And a lot of people don't understand it. But you've heard, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the New World Order. Well, you know, it's not really new. Satan tried it, the war in heaven which I did a study on that. And then he tried it in the Tower of Babel and then multiple other kingdoms, you know, in Egypt, under pharaohs, and um, a Babylon, Assyria. And, you know, it hasn't really, Satan's plan really hasn't changed. This is why Satan tries and succeeds, oftentimes, usually, to get people to sin. You know, this is why they're promoting this sodomy agenda and teaching the kids about Harry Potter and witchcraft, why I can have books on Satanism in the public libraries and the schools, but I can't have a Bible. Why is that? Is the Bible an evil, wicked book that has to be banned from, from public schools? But I can take books on Satanism. They, nobody ever says a word. Matter of fact, one time I was in the Denver Public Library, and there was a lawsuit, some probably one of the kosher ones, or one of their front groups, said, oh, it, you know, we got to have separation of church and state. We can't have Bibles in the public library. That's evil. So they took the Bibles away, completely took them away. Well, I was doing some research on Satanism and the occult, and guess what I found? The Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey. His real name was Levy. Yeah, he was Jewish, or, well, the synagogue of Satan, I should say. So, you couldn't have the Holy Bible in the public library, but the Satanic Bible, nobody says a word. And why does Satan do this? Because he knows that the Lord in his anger is not going to tolerate people being Satanists and, you know, ignoring the Lord. The Lord says he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God. And that's why Satan always tries to lead us into sin. Because eventually the Lord will say, Oh, I've had enough. That's it. And guess what? That's what the plagues of Revelation are all about. 
you know, he's just, you know, eventually when people start worshiping Satan, the beast, the false prophet, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he's going to say, oh, that's it. You want to worship Satan? Let him protect you. Let him save you. And he's going to destroy the earth a little bit at a time. One of these days, I'm going to try to get to it and do a study. Um, you know, it's interesting. The plagues of Revelation basically follow um, the six days of creation in Genesis 1 and verse, chapters 1 and chapters 2. You know, the Lord created the earth. The Lord created the, the, um, the fish. He created the trees. And you look at the in the plagues in Revelation, well, he kills the fish. He kills the trees. He kills, you know, it's interesting. There's a correlation there. But I'm working full time. I just don't have time to do all this stuff. You know, I have a list of a thousand projects I'd like to do. But um, then again, I don't want to live like John the Baptist and wear goat skins and and, and eat locusts and wild honey. Of course, the police would arrest me as being homeless anyways. Can you imagine that? The, uh, we used to have a bunch of homeless people, and they seem like they've disappeared. I've been hearing um, stuff that they're rounding up all the homeless people. I don't know. Probably true. Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 12. And then we're going to read verse 13. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which... If a man do, he shall even live in them, and my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Let's go to verse 16. Because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. And let's face it. That's what America is today. The idols of money, sex, witchcraft. Um, I, you know, there are more witches in the United States than there are Christians now. Yeah, there are. Believe me. Well, don't believe me, but God said, let every man, let God be true. Paul said, let God be true, but every man a liar. And that's me. In the book of Hosea, now just remember, the Lord said it was to be a, the, you know, like for example, the Sabbath was to be a sign. In Hosea 2.11, he says, I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. God is, you know, cursed. He cursed the people for not following at him. But, um, you know, if you, when you read chapter 12 of, of Matthew, you know, Jesus went through the corn and the disciples were hungry, hungry. And, you know, they began to, pluck the corn, ears of corn in to eat. And of course, then the hypocrites, the Pharisees came and they're saying, behold, this is verse two, behold, thy disciples do that, which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. So what did Jesus tell them? Uh, well, let's take a look. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was unhungered? And they that were with him? See, David went into the um, temple on the Sabbath day. 
Um, and what he did was he ate the showbread that was only lawful for the priests. So, uh, let's see. How he, uh, verse 4, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. And that's right. Christ was greater than the temple. The temple didn't give people salvation. Faith in Christ gave the people their salvation. Christ is greater than the temple. And what do the Jews and the Hebrew roots people want to do? They want to rebuild the temple, all the while ignoring the Son of God. It's sheer blasphemy, people. Verse 7, Jesus speaking. But if ye, who? The hypocrites, the Jews. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. You see, Jesus said the great commandment was to love the Lord, and the second was like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these hung all the law and the prophets. So if you have faith in Christ, Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath day. But I still think it's not a bad idea to take the seventh day, make it a day of rest, and do that day for your Bible studies. And, you know, but that's my opinion. Jesus didn't say, believe on me and keep the Sabbath and thou shalt be saved. No, he didn't say that. All right, Matthew chapter 10, verse, chapter 12, verse 10. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Who is saying this? The Jews, the hypocrites, because they want to accuse Jesus of being evil. Matter of fact, I can show you all kinds of Jewish writings where they uh, said Jesus was a, a horrible, evil man because he broke the Sabbath. Verse 11, and he said unto them, Jesus speaking to the hypocrites, right? What man shall there be among you that shall not have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Oh, boy. So here it is. They would uh, take the sheep, take it out of a pit. They'd water their, their animals on the Sabbath day. But yet they wanted to kill Jesus because he healed sick people on the Sabbath day. And you wonder why he called them hypocrites. Because basically what they're saying is, my animal, my animal is more important and better than that person you're healing. Believe me, Jesus had good reason to call them hypocrites. In Matthew 24, Jesus warned that when you saw the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, this is what you were supposed to do. Um, they, they were told to flee to the mountains. Okay? Well, I've been reading Matthew 24 a lot lately in these studies, but... Uh, all right, let's go Matthew 24 and start in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let him, I'm sorry, then let them, 
which be in Judea, flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Okay. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Boy, that's going to be rough. You know, if, if you got to take off in the winter and you, you can't go back to the house to get your coat, that's going to be rough, people. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why is that? Why did Jesus say this? Hmm. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to come, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, and that's you people, those in Christ, but those of the elect's sake, those, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Therefore, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, miracles, people, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. See, when Christ comes, every eye is going to see him coming in the clouds. And we're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. And if we're not, well, it's the wrong Messiah. In Mark chapter 2, you had the, uh, the hypocrites trying to catch Jesus. But in verse 27, And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath was made for man to rest. Your body can't work seven days a week. The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. All right, let's go to John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. So there's a pool, right? Which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt. Halt means they can't walk. You ever, you know, in, in uh, when the Germans tell you to stop, they say halt. And uh, so of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. In other words, he stirred the water up. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Isn't that interesting? This is, I think this is the only place in the Bible that mentions this, the pool of Bethesda. So an angel would go down there, stir the water up, and whoever stepped into the water was cured of whatever disease they had. So, verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's a long time to be sick, people. You've heard of an infirmary? Well, that's like an infirmary is a place where you take sick people or people with problems, you know. You may not have a disease, but you could be crippled or whatever. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lie, and he wasn't lying, not telling the truth, but he was, you know, lying on the ground. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, 
he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? In other words, are you going to are you going to be healed? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So evidently, when the water got troubled, the first person that got in the water um, after the, the water was stirred up, they were healed. The second person got nothing, evidently. I, that's how I read it. So, Verse 8, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more. Wow. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Hmm. So it was the Jews that were persecuting Jesus and wanted to kill him because he healed somebody. Isn't that sweet of them? But Jesus, it's verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh here too, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. Oh, tell that to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Will somebody tell that to the Jehovah's Witnesses? Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, there also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So let's read this again, verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. See, Jesus is going to be our judge. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Did you, did you catch that? That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Well, the Jews watched Jesus perform miracle after miracle after miracle that only God the Father could have done, raising the dead. Where in the Bible does it say that Satan ever raised the dead? Yes, Satan has a certain amount of power. He can do a certain amount of miracles. But where in the Bible does it ever say that Jesus, uh, the devil ever raised the dead? But Jesus did. Satan can't raise the dead as far as I know. I've never seen it in the Bible. If I'm wrong, somebody show me. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus healed the sick, made the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He made the lame to walk. And yet the Jews rejected him. They dishonored him. 
And then the Jehovah's Witnesses, they dishonor Jesus too because they, they say he's a created being. They say that he's just an angel. And then the Mormons, they dishonor Jesus by saying that he is the brother of Satan. Uh, do you want Satan's brother as your savior? Uh, I'm going to pass on that one. They dishonor Jesus. You ever wonder why people, why God blinds the Jews and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses? It's because they dishonor Jesus. They don't let the Bible speak to them. They use their own thought processes. The Jehovah's Witnesses will believe anything out of the Watchtower Publication Society. The Mormons will believe anything that comes out of Salt Lake City, but they won't believe what the New Testament says. Matter of fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses hated the King James Bible that they used for over 50 years. They hated it so much they wrote their own perversion of the Bible. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condem condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him a Authority. God the Father has given Jesus authority and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. See, Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. He's both. The only person in history that ever did this and it probably and it ever will. Mar verse 28. Marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and ye bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his life, in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent. Him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Think about this, people. This, this, Jesus is talking to the Jews. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. 
And this is going to happen. When the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition comes, the Jews are going to receive him. You watch. Jesus right here is giving a prophecy. Verse 44. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? See, Christ was the lawgiver. He was the word of God. It was Christ that gave the law to Moses on the mount, the Ten Commandments. You know? In Genesis 49 and verse 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. A scepter was a uh, like a baton, very ornate, decorated, and it signified rulership. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's referring to Christ. All right, turn to James chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fighting, fightings among you? Oh boy, boy, that's we've had so many wars uh, in the Middle East for the last, oh, I don't know, for as long as I can remember. And I'm, I'm going to be 61 this year. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even from your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. In other words, you ask the Lord, but you ask him wrong. You don't ask him the right way, and you don't ask him for the things that he wants you to have. You're asking for the things of the flesh. That's what the charismatic movement is all about, TBN. Oh, Lord, make me a wealthy man. You know, give me an island. Uh, give me a beachfront property and a super yacht and a uh, a Learjet, you know, that's that's the things they ask for. They don't ask for the wisdom of the Bible. They don't ask for um, the gift of healing to be able to go and, and heal people and, and make their lives better. They don't ask for uh, a farm to grow food to be able to feed the homeless. No, they don't ask for those things. They don't ask for things that would benefit God's people. They ask things that will benefit them. Charismatics are the among the biggest hypocrites in the world. And, and I, I look forward to the day that, that God destroys all of them on TBN. I look forward to that day. I really do. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And that's what they are. They're, they're, their lust is avarice, greed. Verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Enmity is hatred. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Good question. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Nigh means near. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil 
one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth the brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver, and that's Christ. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgeth another? You know, that that's that's the problem with the church. Uh, I've seen people that were smoking would judge somebody because another person drinks. Or another person that was a thief saying, well, that guy, he's, you know, he sleeps around with all these different women, you know. I mean, it's like, just because I have one sin that you don't have, you know, are we to, are we better because our sin is less less than another in our own eyes? I don't know. I don't think so. That's not what this is teaching. Now, I'm not talking about abominations. Okay? Um, there were certain certain sins that God called an abomination that were punishable by death. That God didn't want that rotten apple in the barrel to ruin the whole barrel. And, uh, Witchcraft is one of those. And they don't want witches in public schools teaching your children how to be Satanists. God doesn't want that. He didn't want it back in the old days, and he doesn't want it today. But the Christians have no spine. They have no backbone. They're a bunch of sorry wimps. And they don't care about their children. Because if they cared about their children, they would remove the witches and Satanists from the halls of power and politics and from the public schools. And they're gonna be they're they're gonna be shocked when they find out that their little pre trib rapture doctrine was put in place by Satan to so that they would give up their fight for this world to be the salt of the earth. Verse 13, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that, ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this and that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I love the book of James. I love the book of James. It's great. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, well, that's trouble, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus, uh, and in the kingdom of and patience of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ has a kingdom. It's coming to earth. It's in heaven now, but it, it's coming to earth one day. And every kingdom has a king. And every king and kingdom has laws. Remember that. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. According to legend, um, the, uh, they tried to kill John, and they couldn't do it. And I, I don't mean they threw a knife at him and missed. I mean, they stuck him in boiling oil, and uh, just they tried to kill him, and they couldn't do it. I don't know if it's true or not, I don't know if it's just a story, but uh, they tried many times to kill John, and he just wouldn't die, you know? And um, so finally they banished him on the Isle of Patmos, hoping that he would disappear and never be heard from again and die of old age. Well, guess what? He got the vision for the book of Revelation. And today we've got uh, this wonderful book because of John.
I don't know if it's true or not. I, I'm just, you know, bringing that out there. All right, let's see. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and we'll close this uh, Bible study out. Verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of such people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. Remember, Jesus said he was going to be the judge. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, for her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunders, thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Omnipotent, that means all-powerful. Omni is a Greek word, and the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Contrary to what the Hebrew roots and the Jew liars will tell you. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. One day I hope to do a study on the, um, the, the clean, white, linen marriage garment of the Lamb. There's a lot in the Bible about this. A lot. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You know, it's Christ that gives us the, uh, the garment that covers us. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And it's not our righteousness, it's our righteousness in Christ. It's, it's his righteousness. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, the testimony of Jesus, the things that he says, it's the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, who's his own blood, people. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's Christ, the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And that people is Christ. 
And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Uh, and these are the people that oppose Christ. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles, miracles before him, which had, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped the image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And that's when he when Christ returns, people. Christ is the Word of God. All right, well, this has been an hour. And um, I'm hoping to uh, do another study today. But All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministry. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Until next time, people. Goodbye.